Okay, th thanks, Michelle, and good to see a few people out there at the moment. Um, so we did try and come up with a bit of a, a title for this uh, a talk. Now, can I just check everyone can hear okay? No issue, yeah, good, good, great. So the, the talk we started with, or the, or the title for the talk was sort of uh, Systems Restructure of Playgroup SA Perspective. I'm, I'm not so sure that's the best title, the restructure. Maybe it's more uh, uh, realigning some of the processes and decision-making and power relations that exist within the structure. Um, anyway, I want to frame the thinking here around three pillars, drawing on the work of a uh, Indian economist uh, named Rajaram Rajan, something like that. He worked as a chief economist and director of research, International Monetary Fund, governor of the Reserve Bank of India. You, you can find him out there in lots of different podcasts, quite interesting. Um, what, what he does, though, is he, he provides three, fill, uh, three pillars to look at things through, and they include the state, the markets, and the community. So I'll, I'm going to use that to sort of frame some of my discussions here, not, not necessarily big systems, but they are big systems, right? And they all, they all inter interact as well. Um, I'm going to look at uh, what they are just quickly to give some definitions and then what we see when they become unbalanced. I'll go through um, how I think playgroups are being left behind as a key pillar or as a key component within the community system and how ABCD can offer some legitimacy to decision making by the community uh, for, for the community to, to really, I guess, lead what they want to do. I might call that sort of facilitating strategic governance. Now, so brief definition of the state, I'm really referring to those sort of political, uh, the political governance structure of a country, and of course, the separation of the powers as we usually have, the judiciary, legislature, and the executive. Um, the markets are really, uh, in, in that relation, I'm talking about that those private economic structures that facilitate the production exchange of goods and services in the economy and all variants thereof, the markets of employment, markets of finance, they're all around us. It's, it's like we can't escape this stuff. You know, and the markets also, well, when I'm referring to markets, I'm talking about those individuals that work in the businesses and the corporate structures and the corporations themselves, that, that they all have a role to play here. The community, I'm sort of coming back to this uh, uh, archetypal de definition of community in modern times with all the divisions that come across or come along with that kind of definition. You know, where I'm coming from that place-based kind of perspective, we're all living in that location. You know, so I recognise there are different communities, com you know, book clubs, knitting clubs, uh, crochet, I think that's kind of knitting, I don't have a good understanding of that. Um, and and they can they can they can exist in in that place based community, but I'm really coming back to that location, if we get that. Um, so when it, when I start thinking about systems restructure or rebalancing, I think is probably the best way. The the solution there's some there's something in the solution that lies in rebalancing these three pillars that seem to uh, uh, surround us everywhere we look rebalancing the state's role, the market's role, and the community's role. I certainly think the community's role has been eroded by the state and by the market hugely. And I'm gonna try and convince you of that a little bit <laughs> at the start here. Um, so when they are unbalanced, now if we look at a state that uh, is unbalanced, we're gonna see the greatest aggregation of power and resources through the centralized processes away from community. State taking those decision making, the resources away from community, leaving them to fend for themselves, but perhaps. The more extreme versions of um, state power and, and monopoly, we might see surveillance mechanisms in place, huge and inequitable distribution of wealth, um, support for people, um, you know, the, the inequitable distribution of support for of wealth and for people, and that can also be a byproduct of market failure. Ultimately, the point here is the state and its institutions have the greatest concentration of power, and we can see this certainly playing out in some areas of the world right now. Now, the markets, when they're unbalanced, well, that might have started with 
with the whole introduction of, of the market. Okay, let's all go in and focus on our competitive advantage and our specialization. What happens? Less time to be at home and work with your neighbors. You've got to, you've got to prop up this organization you're working for or support your own sort of wealth development away from the community again. Now, when the market pillar grows in its power base, there is a separation from community again. In a, in a community or country which is uh, heavily dominated by the market, I think we're gonna see everything being very transactional and contracts. It's, it's everything from supplying a service or product has a cost that has to be covered or borne by someone. And, and I guess we can thank the monks at this point for their whole double entry accounting, which really helped things along a bit too, back in the 12th, 13th century. Anyway, so that, that, that's probably another, another discussion for another time. Um, now, there was once a time, okay, someone's house might burn down. Now this may, may have been quite recently in Australia too with all the, the bushfires. Okay, so um, house burns down, community will rally around, help and rebuild. Now, any Queenslanders on this call? Because, oh, that's good, because I was gonna give them a, a, a plug around their rebuilding after the 2011 floods and, and the bushfires. I don't usually give Queenslanders too much credit, uh, particularly with the last um, results of the election, but we don't need to go there right now. It's just a political scientist thing that's coming out. Um, so, th so there's examples today of communities coming together to rebuild a house, okay? Great, great, great work for community. Fantastic. But what's really going on in the background from the state and the market perspective? Think about it. The house is burnt down. What are you gonna, gotta check insurance, market function, gotta rebuild, need council approval, state's function, need an electrician, gotta be qualified, get a group of volunteers together to rebuild the house. There are multiple compliance issues that you're gonna to need to meet to pull them together. Okay, let's get some businesses into um, investing funding in, in, in the rebuilding of a community. The state will step in and start providing tax write-offs. Now, no, no problem here at all. I'm just trying to really bring to our attention the extent to which the state and markets continue to interact and almost direct some of the activities going on in the community. I hope that makes some kind of sense. And it also shows the immense barriers that we can face in the community when we really just want to get on with helping each other. It can, it can really uh, start to impact our ability to share the gifts of our heart, head, hand, and heal. That's, that, that, that was a D plug, that one, I think, anyway. Um, and I'm not saying like electrical compliance is a bad thing, okay? We've all seen that picture in some developing country and there's this like junction of wires up on, up on an electricity pole and they're going everywhere and you go, how is this not on fire? But anyway, so it's not a bad thing, right? it's not the point. It's just that they are so out of balance at the moment. I think community is just being forgotten so much. So what happens when the community becomes unbalanced? All right, so this one took me a bit to work it out or to, to come up with some idea around it, some kind of theory. But I think that communities can separate from the market and state themselves. So communities um, focus on strengthening their social connections. Wonderful, that's great. But what could also be going on is we see the separation of these communities from other communities. We end up with this social stratification, the haves and the have-nots. And we can forget, forget about what it means to actually be working with everyone for, for, the, for the good of all, right? Point is it's un, unbalanced and, and I would say it's inequitable to continue in the way we are with the influence from the state and the markets and less. So we need to reclaim and get things back in balance. Um, so what is one common thread through these three pillars is they're all dependent on relationships. There is this deep web of interconnected human relations where, where the different values and norms play out, driving different preferences and normative approaches on how we should be organizing ourselves. The market's got their view, the state's got their view, community's got their view. Um, and at the same time, you know, the pe people are the state, people are the markets and people are our communities. And there's plenty, I think, in our community. So we might've lost, lost that focus on what it means to get back to this equitable kind of, um, space. Now, 
where, when, we, when we begin to come up with hopes and dreams for greater outcomes in our community, we sort of, I think us as professionals in this space, we kind of, we all know this, but we, we need others as well to start to drop their professional arrogance, look at the strengths, get their hands dirty. And I've heard it said on uh, a couple of the talks, get away from our desks, right? You've got to get out there and meet the face to face. It's a, it is a yes to having the right people around the table. It's a yes to influencing the right people and having the right people to influence. It's a massive yes to those who have an aspiration to see these systems and structures change. And those who are happy to push from the ground up to bring the top down into alignment, it, it's got to happen. And depending on the type of aspiration, I think we do need representatives from the market who can, to use the term loosely, buy in to the community's aspiration or the community's vision for themselves. We need to get the politicians and policy makers um, who can affect change at a legislative level, including a shift in governance and political accountability, need them to start reimagining what it means. Uh, they, they need to wait and hear from the community before making decisions. Um, so there is a bit of a dislocation of culture and disparate ideals, I think, in some of our, our, our most challenging communities that, that we're really trying to build from the ground up and it's no easy task to bring them together. Um, some might be on the run from the state, but these are very real things that we have to face. But um, and, and there can also be an intergenerational exclusion from the market and a massive loss of political power that we need to recognise as well. And that can continue to create divisions that are really hard to conquer. Now, you know, here, you know, I could, could probably reference the ongoing systemic and institutional racism over the years that continue today. And the very systems of the state and the markets and individuals maintain this systemic prejudice. And that, that can, as I've said, continue to have deleterious effects on our communities here. And, and we, we somehow, through all of this murk and whatever, it, I don't even know if murk's a word, it's just thinking like it's murky. I've, he I've heard it said before, but it seems really murky at some time. We've got to, we've got to come through that work work with the people and find those shared aspirations have a shared understanding but we'll hear over and over again the state saying nothing to see here we've got equal opportunity law and policies what's the problem we'll hear our corporate saying oh they don't exclude it's all about meritocracy but there's another issue with this whole idea of meritocracy you know it can be strongly argued that meritocracy itself is flawed and only further excludes those who are not born into affluence or wealth or have a good education from actually getting a job. Again, we're just seeing these big pillars, the state and the market continually excluding by this whole history. And don't tell other men maybe, but this whole patriarchal BS that, that goes on that, that it's all really born from. Now, the extent of these issues are far ranging and, and I, I have often wondered what, what it would mean to sit down and look at all of the Royal Commissions and Inquiries say into um, uh, 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 issues that, that our First Nations people have faced, list the amount of recommendations in those inquiries and Royal Commissions and go, well, how many, how many have we actually followed up and actually looked at implementing? I've done some work on that already in, on one of the reports. And again, abject failure of the state to actually follow through and do anything about it. Sorry if I'm going a bit farther. Anyway, one thing that can bring people together is stories of place and culture, and that's art and music can bring people together. So my question here is how can we use stories to bring people together? Now, so this, this little little vignette story, whatever you want to call it, starts off a bit um, boring in, in, in how you'd expect it. You know, I was working with, with uh, a group of um, or in program design development around uh, postnatal depression. We, we, we saw over about 430 parents come through this program. It was your, it was your classic wraparound thing. Referrals came in. There was a play group once a week. There was a parenting group. There was home visiting. The same worker did um, all, of those, all of those parts of the program. There were some amazing outcomes. We, we know this through all of the analysis of the 
Edinburgh scale, from the anxiety scales, the attachment scales, you name it, was really good. Um, anyway, I got to know a, a group of um, a group of the parents or the mums that, that went through this program, came out the other side, but I wasn't convinced. Like I know great outcomes, we'll, we, we need those outcomes, that's fantastic, but I've just, I've just had this inkling that maybe we missed something, maybe what would have happened if we got in a bit earlier? What Was there anything? So just sat down, where we sat down every, every couple of weeks, and this is a story of one that got away, and what we unpacked, what did it mean? Like, what could have been done sooner for you? And they all said the same thing. They just wanted someone to knock on the door early on and say, hey, are you okay? What can we do? And try and build that classic neighbourhood kind of network. That this is in a place based and and we started mapping it out what do we need a facebook group great maybe like they, these guys were so switched on they were like if we could in this little area people um you know start a closed group get people talking that this wasn't me this was all their idea great okay well here i am working in a program which is supposed to fund community activities right well um didn't quite all go as well as I thought. Um, didn't quite get the buy-in from the uh, bureaucrat in um, government, we'll just say that much. This is a decentralized program that's meant to provide funding for these kind of things. Um, and then there was also this massive culture of risk aversion from the organization who we'd, we'd spoke to about delivering it. Well, we can't have a Facebook group. Oh no, too, too, too much stuff can go wrong. So here you are going, Hey, sorry, it's probably just that classic failure of the state and the market, maybe the market being the NGO, the, the state being the funding provider, all the best intentions, yet risk aversion, all these bloody artifacts of the state and the market just got in the way of that one. Anyway, I won't, won't go along. How, how am I going, Dee? How much longer? Two minutes, five, three. All right, okay, all right, I better, I better get on with it. Uh, um, so I wanna just talk about the playgroup thing, which, which thank you for that opportunity. So I, I would argue that playgroups have been left behind a little bit. Um, now, and I'll come into the COVID stuff in a second. So in Australia, we've got our national standards for early childhood education and care. Essentially, playgroups aren't part of that, um, those national standards. They don't apply to playgroup. Now, I might be a little biased, but I would think that playgroups play a vital part in the service system for connecting people, for community development, for bringing kids and parents together, for them to imagine their futures together. In, in that community, you, you meet, you, I hear so many stories of people making lifelong friends, um, just from that play group where they're living, working, caring, playing together, that, that's what it's all about. Um, so, some of the some of the things missing because we're not recognised in the national standards. I think there's no appropriation in the budget for playgroups. There's no. It's got to be a user pay system. And we're we're probably looking at uh, you know like ah oh, playgroups. Well, the the market can sort that out. If no one's interested, no one will go. And then it, there, there's lots of barriers though for the community to actually even engage in a playgroup. Turn up. Well, you need some insurance if you want to come deliver your playgroup here. And there's all these artificial barriers which we exist one reason we exist to help that and also to get the messages out now covid crisis and recovery plans heard about all these business plans that people got to do well um there's no direction provided from the government on when playgroups can start meeting again uh see businesses that were forced to shut down they've got to do a covid plan playgroups i don't know they're not a business it's a community they're, they're just meeting they've no, not cool. Uh, don't, don't need to do it. Have a look through all of the roadmaps out there. And if you can find anywhere that mentions playgroups can come back at this point, I'd be happy to see it. Now that, that has good effects and it has bad effects. In good, oh wow. Some good, you know, uh, we can make it up ourselves and uh, some bad, as I mentioned, we're not, uh, budget, we don't know, I face a very uncertain future and it's an uncertain future for the community too. I better get to the main point that I, I was hoping to make. So 
I want to just say around ABCD, I think um, it provides a really good soft entry point for facilitating great discussions with community. While we've got lots of frameworks and tools to help those conversations along, we don't necessarily always have to frame it in that way. We don't have to put up all and say, we're to go from A to B to C to do this. But having the conversations about how we capture that. Now, I've done a bit of writing around legitimacy and the, and the importance for that political pillar to understand um, what we're doing and that it's legitimacy. And one of the things that is missing, and I think that we could use ABCD to, ABCD to push a bit more in the politics, is the throughput legitimacy. Okay, so we know what our inputs, the meetings, time, energy, everything that we put in, the outputs, this happens, blah, blah, blah. But how are we actually getting there? And that's where it sits. That's where it's most important for community is those conversations and demonstrating this back to the government policy makers to start thinking about how they're going to change the way they make their decisions. So if we can get the governance structures to shift and change the influence of power from the state markets back to community, I'm pretty sure that we're going to be in a far better position. Where it's sort of like policy maker, politician, you don't get to make decisions until we've heard from the community. Otherwise, the decisions will continue, I think, to disadvantage our communities that are here across Australia, across the globe. And uh, hopefully we can achieve some kind of uh, rebalance. Um, and yeah, maybe for us so-called professionals, let's keep in mind the influence and roles that we have to play in shifting all of the dynamics and getting things back in balance.